Let's look at a few more examples of where the prisoner's dilemma plays out in real life. So um, this example is of two uh, cell phone companies in a small town who are, who are a duopoly. Uh, these, these numbers in this example correspond to an example that we did a couple of videos ago. So go back and watch that if you haven't, um, where we talked about unstable uh, solutions, unstable cooperation in an oligopoly. And specifically, we use this example of a duopoly where there are just two firms, right? Um, and the firms can decide together to collude. And if they do collude, they each charge a high price and keep their quantities of customers that they serve low, right? But um, we saw when we worked through this with the, the numbers and the table and the algebra a couple of videos ago, um, we saw that each firm had an incentive to cheat because it turns out that if AT phone sticks to the plan and charges the high price and serves the lower number of customers, um, and Horizon decides to charge the lower price, Horizon steals the customers and makes more money, right? Um, where if the, the flip side is true, where if Horizon sticks to the plan, keeps the high price, a T phone can charge a slightly lower price and run away with all the revenue as well. Um, so, so we can represent this dilemma as a game. It's a prisoner's dilemma where each firm has to choose their strategy, not knowing what the other firm will do and not knowing whether you can trust the other firm, right? We know what we agreed to, but I don't know if I can trust them to stick to that plan. So let's start analyzing this by putting ourselves in Horizon's shoes. I don't know if AT Phone is going to stick to the plan or not, but I know they have two options. They can either stick to the plan or they can cheat. And so let me look at what's best for me. If AT Phone sticks to the plan, then we're in this column, and my options are to also stick to the plan and, and make $27,000, or to lower my price, to cheat, and make $52,500, which is better. Clearly, more money is better for me, right? Um, what if AT Phone cheats, though? What if they don't stick with the plan? What if they lower their price? Then we're in this column. And if I stick with my high price, then they run away with all the revenue. So, of course, what's better for me is also to cheat, also to lower my price, right? So it turns out that I have a dominant strategy of cheating, of not sticking with the plan. Because regardless of what AT phone does, it's best for me if I lower my price, if I cheat on the plan. Um, and keep in mind, lowering a price is the same thing as increasing the number of customers that you serve because of the, the law of demand. So AT Phone has exactly the same thought process, right? What if Horizon sticks to the plan? Then my options are to also stick to the plan and have 27000 or to cheat and have 52500 This one's better for me. Um, but if Horizon lowers their price, if they cheat, then obviously we're in this row and what's better for me is also to cheat. So it turns out each of our players in this, in this game, each firm has a dominant strategy of lowering their price, of cheating and not sticking with the plan. And we have a Nash equilibrium at the, the scenario where each of them cheats. We have a lower price for each firm where if they'd been able to stick to the plan, if they had been able to cooperate, they would have gone with this cell up here where everybody sticks to the plan and they both get more money, right? The revenues are higher in this cell than they are in this cell. The problem is we, this is unstable. Everyone has an incentive to change their mind if we're here. This is where we end up because this is the stable equilibrium, the no regrets equilibrium, right? Similarly, if we think about um, this scenario, 
where the two firms are deciding to serve a low number of customers versus a high number of customers, right? Which is a similar decision to um, higher prices and lower prices because of the law of demand. So these numbers match up exactly with what we did in our previous example, where um, if if Horizon sticks with the plan, but AT Phone uh, doesn't, then Horizon has a low number of customers, AT Phone serves a few more customers and improves their own revenues while at the same time decreasing revenues for Horizon because they have decreased the market price. So we can analyze the game the same way. Um, from Horizon's perspective, we ask the what ifs, and it turns out that regardless of what AT phone does, Horizon's best response is to cheat, to serve the high number of customers. Um, same thing for AT phone. Regardless of what Horizon does, their best response is to cheat and serve the high number of customers, driving the market price down. And so we have the dominant strategy of cheating for each of the two players, and our Nash equilibrium is that they'll each serve a higher number of customers where everyone would have been better off if we had stuck with the plan. So these are two ways of looking at really the same uh, scenario for AT Phone and Horizon. Um, what if I increase my number of customers or what if I lower my price, right? Um, it's a very similar um, similar dilemma for the, for the firms. Now here's another place that the prisoner's dilemma shows up. And we discussed this some when we talked about monopolistic competition and advertising, right? So say we have two competitors, Coke and Pepsi, right? And they're trying to decide, should I advertise or not? And it turns out if nobody advertises, then we're down here in this cell where everybody has $125 million, right? That's pretty nice. That's awesome. If we could get together and decide, let's just not advertise, then we'd run away with a lot, a lot of money each, right? But the problem is, if I know that my competitor is not going to advertise, so if I am Pepsi and I know that Coke has agreed not to advertise, right? Then I know that we're in this column, the do not, the Coke does not advertise column. And I actually have an incentive then to go put up a billboard. Because if I put up a billboard when Coke doesn't, then I steal some of their customers. I get 150 million. They are left with just 75 million. And so I have an incentive to deviate from the plan, right? But I don't know that Coke is not also going to deviate. What if Coke advertises? So I have to ask myself the what ifs, like we always do in these games, right? What if Coke advertises? Then we're definitely in this column. And if I'm Pepsi, my options are to advertise also and make $100 million, or not to advertise and just let Coke steal my customers and make $75 million. So I definitely, if Coke does advertise, I want to advertise. And if Coke does not advertise, I want to advertise. It turns out that if we, if we analyze this game from Coke's perspective, it's going to be exactly the same. And the... Each of the two firms has a dominant strategy of advertising, even though everybody was better off if no one advertised. The problem is, if your buddy's not advertising, if your competitor is not advertising, then you can steal their customers if you put up a billboard. And no one wants to be the guy who's the only one not advertising, because then you're losing. You're letting them take your customers. And so the cooperative outcome is not stable. There's an incentive to cheat. There's an incentive to change your mind, and we end up instead at the Nash equilibrium, which is where everything is stable and no one has any regrets at the end of the day, the no regrets equilibrium. So advertising is, is a prisoner's dilemma. If both firms advertise, their costs go up, but each firm's campaign cancels each other out, so everybody's making less money than they would if they didn't advertise. Both firms would be better off not advertising. But if one firm agrees to not advertise, the other firm has an incentive to cheat on that plan. The other firm would advertise to steal the first firm's uh, customers.
Here's another example of a prisoner's dilemma. It's the effort dilemma. And many of you, if you're a college student, you, uh, you're you probably familiar with this dilemma. This is group work um, in a college class, right? So Mary and Paul are working together, and each of them is going to choose whether to work hard or to shirk or not do the work, right? Um, and if both of them work hard, then it's awesome. They both make 100. They both have are super happy at the end of the day, right? So the way to look at these numbers is to think about their happiness at the end of the day. So these are numbers measuring their happiness. So each of them is 100% happy, right? 100 happy. If they both worked hard, they did well, and uh, they were rewarded for their hard work. But if Mary knows that Paul is a hard worker and that she doesn't have to do any work, but she'll still get the good grade, then she has an incentive to shirk and let Mar let Paul do all the work for her, right? And when that happens, if Paul does the work and Mary doesn't, then Mary is super happy because she got a good grade uh, but didn't have to work for it, and Paul is really mad, right? So Paul's happiness goes down from 100 to 20 because Paul just had to do all this work for his grade and maybe didn't even make as good a grade as he would have if Mary had also worked hard and supported him and helped with the project, right? So Paul's really mad because he did all the work and uh, got a, lo a little bit lower grade than he could have if Mary had worked with him, right? Um, so the there's a similar story if Paul is thinking about how hard Mary will work, right? Um, and so let's put ourselves in Paul's shoes. Paul doesn't know if Mary's going to work hard or not, but he knows that if Mary does work hard, <laughs> then he go, he's going to make a good grade whether he works hard or not, so he has an incentive to shirk. He knows that if Mary does not work hard, then he doesn't want to do all the work for her, right? And so notice he's happier if they both shirk than he is if she shirks and he works, right? Because if she's not going to work hard, then he's not either. And so his happiness level is actually higher if he shirks in either situation. Mary, the same thing. This is a symmetric problem um, where if we analyze it from Mary's point of view, we have exactly the same thought process that if Paul's going to work hard, then I don't have to. If Paul's not going to work hard, then I don't want to, right? So, um, so it turns out that the incentive for everyone is to shirk and not to do the work. And um, so we have a Nash equilibrium here at the point where everyone shirks, where everyone would have really been happier if they both worked hard. Um, this is, again, one of those scenarios like we talked about in the last video where you may actually see people working hard, um, even if they know that their partner may not work hard. One is because maybe their preferences aren't exactly like we see in this example. Maybe Paul wouldn't actually be that mad about Mary not working. He just wants the good grade, and so maybe this number wouldn't be 20 for him. So that's one thing that could, that could change the outcome here. Another thing that could change the outcome here is if Paul and Mary work together on projects often, and so they know um, that they have an incentive to maintain this cooperative relationship because it matters not just for this class, but for the next class as well. Um, and so maybe they'll play that, that long-run strategy of maintaining the cooperation because the long-run payoff is better than the short-run payoff of cheating. Um, here are some other examples that you can think about um, of prisoners' dilemmas in everyday life. So people standing at concerts, even though they can see just as well when everybody else sits. <laughs> uh, people shouting at parties, um, even though if everyone would talk in a normal voice or a quieter voice, we still could hear each other. Um, and maybe leaving a tip at an out-of-town restaurant. Why would you do that? You're never going back. It doesn't matter what they think of you, right? Um, so think about these examples of prisoner's dilemma in every life. It actually turns out that prisoner's dilemma is a, is a really useful um, way of analyzing a lot of the scenarios that we find ourselves in in everyday life.